Luke provides us with the food lover's gospel. There are more meals mentioned in Luke than in all of the other gospels. Luke focuses on food and physical nourishment, often using it as symbolically to signify spirit and spiritual nourishment. We need spiritual nourishment just as much as we need physical and emotional nourishment. Our practice of communion, one of the two sacraments recognized by the UCC, fits squarely into this tradition. Communion is a physical meal that represents spiritual nourishment. At the communion table, we are all equal. We take the bread and the cup together as one people in Christ. Communion, done in the spirit of Christ, is always inclusive. And when done properly, from as much of a position of equal footing as we can manage. Today's scripture is not about communion. It's actually about a fancy meal that's held at the home of a Pharisee. And it's also, we also know it's held on the Sabbath. Now, this whole situation was not really typical because Jesus was not invited to eat with the Pharisees very often. But one leader, this one leader of the Pharisees, took a special interest in Jesus and invited him to this meal. Jesus being at the meal does what Jesus often does. He uses this as an opportunity to teach about spirituality. Just as he had used other meals for the same purpose. An opportunity for physical nourishment and an opportunity to provide spiritual nourishment. Now the Pharisees had invited, invited Jesus to eat with them, but the text tells us that the situation was very tense and that Jesus was under intense scrutiny. Jesus enters the Pharisee's home, and perhaps he does notice the guests jockeying for the best seat. So Jesus decides to tell a parable about someone being invited to a wedding banquet. Now, at first, the text of this parable reads not so much like a parable. It actually kind of reads like a wisdom teaching or sage advice, more so than a parable. Jesus makes it clear, however, that this is a parable. He says, this is a parable. So we know to be wary, don't we? We've encountered parables before. Jesus' parables are famous for having hidden layers of meaning and startling twists and turns that impact us in unexpected ways. In our text today, Jesus is at a meal, being closely watched, and so he decides to tell a parable about what? About a wedding banquet. Very similar to what's actually happening around him in the moment. So this parable is easy to misunderstand because the parable describes such a similar situation as the one that was occurring in that moment. Even the Pharisees hearing Jesus' words, even to them it would not be clear if Jesus is describing what he is seeing in that moment or if he's telling a story about another meal, another situation. It would be kind of confusing. So Jesus starts the parable by talking to the guests, by, by talking about the guests suggesting that the dinner guests would be better served by not assuming an honorable seat, but rather by taking a low seat instead. This passage relies on, on some knowledge of ancient banquets. Maybe you've seen depictions of these before. At these banquets, the male, the men, would recline on couches, with the center couch being the place of honor. 
The inhabitants of the place of honor were chosen according to wealth, power, or office that they held. If a more prominent man arrives late, which, as is, is today, would often happen. The most important person often does show up late because they're busy. In that case, a man of lower rank would be asked to move to a less prestigious location. It's a very shameful thing to happen. Unlike the communion table where everyone is equal, at the ancient banquet table, nothing was equal. The banquet table was a product and a reflection of society's stratification and division. It was a model of reality played out at the dinner table. So Jesus first offers sound practical advice to any guest to choose the lowest place so that you can be invited up and be honored. Sounds like pretty wise advice, doesn't it? In fact, Jesus seems to be repeating very similar teaching that we find in Solomon's wisdom writings in Proverbs. Jesus ends his advice to the guests with another wisdom saying, For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Is Jesus really giving advice to Pharisees on how to use humility to better navigate the social stratification of his time? Advice on how to be shrewd in playing the political game at a meal like this? Is that what Jesus is doing? Or at least advice on how to avoid acting like a buffoon who sets himself up for social embarrassment. Since this is a parable, we have to assume that Jesus is pointing to something much deeper than that, don't we? Something much richer. It becomes clear that that is what's going on when we read the advice given to the banquet host in this parable. And that's what Jesus does next. In the parable, he first gives advice to the guests, then he gives advice to a host of such an event. The banquet host in our parable is given advice that would not be considered wisdom teaching. In fact, it would not even make sense compared to the practices of the time. The host is told not to invite his friends. What kind of banquet would you hold and not invite your friends? Don't invite my friends to the banquet? And the host in our parable is told that he should not invite any family or rich neighbors either. This is starting to sound more like a parable, isn't it? Jesus says to the host of the banquet that Jesus says that the host of the banquet should not invite anyone who could invite him to a banquet in return, because then he would be repaid. Hmm. So have your banquet, have your banquet, have a good time, but don't invite anyone who might, who even might repay you. Hmm. Then Jesus tells the host of our parable who he should invite. Mm. Jesus says to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. This would have been unheard of at a real banquet during the time of the Pharisees. It's not such a big surprise to those of us who've come to know Jesus as a man who often suggests comfort for the oppressed and marginalized. Jesus says the host should invite guests who would be unable to repay him for the favor. All the people Jesus describes in this list would have been unable to repay the host. But, but even more than that, not only would they have been unable to repair, repay the host, the groups on this list were actually prohibited by Old Testament law from even being priests or even being Pharisees. The people on this list could not have been a Pharisee, could not have been at this dinner with Jesus. That would have been much more obvious to the folks first hearing this story than it is to us today. 
So then Jesus finishes his teaching by saying that the host would be blessed for inviting guests who could not repay him themselves. And repaid, then they would be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. In this parable, both the guest and the host are warned about taking any action that results in personal recognition. Personal recognition. Humility. Humility is one of those fruits of the Spirit that comes from having a true, deep connection to God. So you don't, you really, your connection is so deep, in fact, if you're truly uh, humble, then your humility does not depend on social status or on peer recognition. It depends on your relationship with God. Humility is a quality that comes up a lot in the Bible, in both the Old and the New Testament. It comes up in one of our congregations, or for many of us in the congregation, a very favorite passage from Micah. And Micah 6, 8 reads, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? You can't fake humility. You can strive for it but you can't fake it. If a person acts humble as a part of some shallow strategy to win recognition from other people, is that true humility? No. And it's fairly obvious to folks it, that it is not. So do we show humility here at church when we invite people to our banquet, to our communion table? We certainly strive to. I think we recognize the value in sharing our lives and bread at the communion table. We recognize that that is just too sacred to be perverted for our own private social advantage or to be limited by petty squabbles of the sort that we humans are really pretty good at coming up with. There is no piety test to come to our table. No poll tax, just so to speak. We're not going to kick you out for something you did or didn't do. We do designate the pastor as the one who blesses and serves the meal, but it is Jesus Christ who sits at the head of the table. This model of reality, this table of equality, and this parable told by Jesus in today's scripture are all intended to free us, to free us from hierarchical relationships and attitudes and the barriers that they create. Think about it. Jesus' words in this parallel can liberate us if we're willing to live out these words. They can free us from feeling like we need to be at the mercy of our culture's ever-present contests of earthly power and esteem. It's going on around us all the time. But back, back to the Pharisees for a moment. The parable in today's scripture's reading was not really a parable for the poor, is it? It was a parable for the Pharisees. This is important. Looking back at them from our day and time, we tend to demonize the Pharisees. To us, it seems that the Pharisees are hopelessly prideful. They certainly seem to play the role of the bad guys in a lot in the Gospels, don't they? But in reality, if we stand back, we realize the Pharisees in their time were working as hard as they could to live out their best understanding of what God wanted. In a lot of ways, the Pharisees were the good people of their day. They really were. Let's be fair. They never missed a religious meeting. They studied the scriptures carefully and honestly. They tithed and they set the moral standards for their culture in their day. 
Today, we would consider them faithful church members. Let's be real. Which we should probably take as a splash of cold water in our own faces. This parable is for us. This is for good, solid church members of means. This is important. Jesus is not demanding that the poor empty themselves more than they already have. Understand? Okay? That's not what this is about. This is not saying to those who have nothing that you have to give more. This is a parable for the comfortable. Our church today still struggles with this reality. Many of us are comfortable. Our ability to serve and care for those who cannot repay us is tied to our treasure in heaven. It's tied to our spiritual connection to God. How do we serve those who cannot repay us? We ask it a lot. We actually do. We do. And, and of course, we do it every week when families visit our children's closet. We have no mind, no thought that we're doing this expecting to be repaid or we're doing it for esteem or for position in this community. That's not why we're doing it. We also help people who walk in off the street, both by praying with them. Sounds so simple, but it's often the first thing Pastor Peter or I do when someone comes to our door. But also by giving them a meal card or maybe a bus token or a little gas money if they need it. This is, this is what our discretionary fund is about. We collect for our discretionary fund on the first Sunday of each month, which is today. Now, this issue of food and food justice has been weighing heavily on, on me and on my mind lately. Our church is located in what is sometimes called an urban food desert. Have you ever heard of that? A food desert. All the good grocery stores are miles away. The closest one is in Frandor. Affordable and healthy food is an issue in this neighborhood, particularly if you're poor and you have no car. What are you going to do? I often wonder if we as a church are being called to do more about the food situation in this area. I'm not sure what. Food ministries have not been my personal calling. I can tell you that, however, that more than one pilgrim member has approached Pastor Peter or myself about it. God seems to be sending us people who are interested in food ministries. And God keeps sending us people who are hungry and in need of a place, a plate, a place at the table. Eventually, God will send us enough people and something new, will, if we're patient, <clears throat> something new and wonderful will happen here at Pilgrim Church once again. I can feel it coming. I don't know what it is. I don't exactly, quite yet, what God is doing. But let me tell you, <clears throat> we're going to continue to be patient and continue to listen to our still speaking God. And we're going to listen to each person that God sends us, whether they're looking for food or whether they're coming saying, hey, I love to cook. I want to cook for folk. I love to buy food. I love to get a great deal. I love to see someone walk away with a bag of groceries. It warms my heart. You know what that's about? That's a calling. That's a calling. Now, now food is already a part of our church life in many ways. It's, I mean, we're already all over this in a lot of ways, right? We do salad luncheons, for example, and pilgrims prepare meals for others all the time, particularly when people are recovering from illness or from a hospital stay. We supply plenty of food for events, vacation Bible school, and the big party we're going to be holding here next Sunday. Next week, when we welcome Pastor Peter back, very exciting, we as a church are inviting and plan to serve food to anyone and everyone who shows up to participate. 
We'll hold our banquet meal under a tent on the lawn. And we have invited people from the neighborhood to join us. Don't know how many will come. We've sent out flyers and invitations. We put it in the paper. All seats, all seats will be considered equal. There will be no seat of honor. And everyone will get the same food. Unlike the ancient wedding banquets where the honored guest actually got the good stuff. It's not the way we do things. We're listening to this parable. At least we're trying to, aren't we? Our event next Sunday is part food ministry, it's part celebration, and it kicks off our new Sunday school year in our outreach year. We will eat, we'll play games, we'll listen to some good music. We will not be in total compliance with today's parable because we aren't going to limit our guests to the poor, crippled, lame, and blind. We're definitely inviting all our friends and relatives and our rich neighbors too. But central to our calling to hospitality is making sure that we don't leave out the poor or anyone else who can't repay us or who might otherwise feel excluded for whatever reason. You're welcome whether you can repay us or not. It's just one of the exciting things we do here at Pilgrim as a community of faith centered on God's grace. And thanks to all of you, all of you who support this church with your time, your talent, and your treasures. You make this all possible with Jesus as our example. Amen.